Uh, welcome to the uh, third panel discussion for today's conference. I'm Thomas Meltzer. I'm a doctoral research candidate here in the School of Law at Queen's University. And it's very nice to be chairing this uh, panel session. We have two speakers in this panel. And each person is invited to speak uh, for up to 20 minutes. After both speakers have presented their papers, we'll have time for questions and answers before we take a break at around the 3 o'clock mark. So I'll introduce our first speaker. It's uh, Professor Nazan Gustenberg. Um, she's an assistant professor of sociology based in Istanbul. She has conducted detailed research on the constitution of migrant women's subjectivities and narratives in urban margins as their form of the intersection of state violence, patriarchal violence, and the violence of capitalism. She's currently researching the manifestations of state violence on materiality and on Kurdistan's geography, bodies, documents, and things. She's a scholar and lecturer, and her writings are widely published. She's a founding member of the Peace Parliament in Turkey, and she's a member of the political group, the Peace and Democracy Party. Hi, so I'm a sociologist, and my vocabulary might be a little bit different than the previous paper, so I hope you will bear with me. Um, so my goal in this presentation will be to describe the emergence of Kurdish children as victims of state violence and as actors of resistance in Turkey. And what I will do is give a brief introduction of how they became an important topic for law, policy and knowledge since mid-2000. Um, but unfortunately I will have uh, no time to discuss how they themselves challenged the boundaries and assumptions of uh, such disciplines like law, policy, and knowledge as actors of politics. And in the end of the presentation, I will very briefly comment on the ongoing peace process from the perspective of children and youth. Uh, being a Kurdish child in Turkey has never been easy. And Evrim Alatas, a prominent women writer who passed away a few years ago, uh, points that Kurdishness has always been an effect and embodiment beyond and above an ethnicity acquired through witnessing state violence during childhood. She states, Kurdish is the one whose father has been beaten. That is why it is not an identity nor a root. It is the anger handed down from father to son. A again, a recent book called Being a Child in the 1990s describes the gruesome violence Kurdish children have witnessed and experienced during the 1990s when state terror manifested itself in torture, forced displacement, forced disappearance, and extra legal murders, all directed to towards the civilian Kurdish population. And the bo book shows that in 1990s, childhood was an experience through which Kurds acquired their identity and their knowledge of the state. Nevertheless, children as a social category separate from adults, needing special legal, political, and social attention and not has not emerged until the second half of 2000s in Northern Kurdistan. I will not go into the details of how, they, the, how children emerged as political actors. Suffice it to say that in the second half of 2000s, children in Kurdistan and in Turkey took over the streets in protest of the state and army. Spe they have specifically protested army's attacks towards the PKK. They have, uh, they have protested mass arrests, police bans, and other repressive measures by throwing stones to police and army. And most recently, they were very active during the hunger strikes and organized mass demonstrations, closing down streets and resisting, and resisting despite being soaked by water and gas. There are a number of sociological studies done on these kids, and these studies show that they constitute a distinctive category compared to previous generations. I should remind you that these children of 2000s were born in the city and their families were largely forcibly displaced. So they are the children of those uh, people we have discussed uh, earlier today. And although most of them have not directly experienced the dirty war of 1990s, they have what we call in sociology post-memory. That is, they know the 1990s 
through the narratives, bodies, and effects of their parents. Most of these kids live in poverty, they must work, they face discrimination at school and at work, and they live in the metropoles where their families have landed after displacement. In other words, what differentiates Kurdish children today from previous generations is first, a deep historical and political consciousness of having been wronged. Second, an experience of urban marginalization, ethnic and class discrimination. And third, a public urban state space where they can act as members of a distinctive category called the youth relatively autonomous from adults. As a sociologist, what I study is how uh, these kids have changed the ethics and aesthetics of the of of what we call political protest, um, despite the fact that even Kurdish politi politicians themselves have condoned their unruly behavior. More particularly, uh, children's politics and what these politics reveal about Kurdish political ideology and practice is a topic I am in deeply interested in. However, this is not what I should talk about today, what I'm talking about today, so let me rather continue with how the Turkish state systematically targets and victimizes these kids. Now, we can talk about a complicated legal, political, and knowledge regime that the state developed in order to rule the unruliness of Kurdish children in uh, northern Kurdistan and Turkish metropoles. And this regime defines children both as state's concern and the, its enemy. So I will talk about distinctive spheres where kids are both uh, defined as, cons as a concern and an enemy. So at the level of social policy, it is not, as you will see, it is not only at the legal level that children are addressed, they are addressed at, at various levels uh, by the state. So I will start with the level of social policy. It's a sphere I work on. Uh, AKP has um, developed a conditional cash transfer program disproportionately targeting Kurdish children. And this is a program which transfers money to families on the condition that their kids remain at school. They don't go to the street, they remain at school, that they attend school. Second social policy is, or second area, through which the government targets these kids through social policy is strict control by an alliance with social services and, po and police. Social service agents target families. They come and visit families in company with the police in order to pressure families to take the kids away from the street. A third social policy is the government uh, distributes free school books, free lunch, to kids at school, so again, that they remain at school, they are under the control of these school spaces, which are, of course, largely discriminatory. And encouragement of informal and formal religious education by means of monetary, monetary and emotional rewards. So these kids are recruited by religious uh, organizations. So this is the sphere of social policy. At the level of knowledge, we have, children have become, these children have become an object of numerous studies, specifically in fields of psychology and social work. Panels, discussions, journal articles are produced about them frequently. Uh, their problems are cited and listed. And of course, all this works to redefine and medicalize their political activity as trauma and or as disease. Uh, and now, at the level of the legal, uh, in 2006, uh, the, uh, a terrorist, uh, the Terrorism Act was passed in Turkey, and this act extended the definition of terrorism to inclu include specifically the practices of children, for example, uh, to cover your face with scarves is defined to be a terrorist act, and we all know children do this practice uh, frequently so that they are not recognized and taken by police once the protests are over. Uh, children, the a second clause of the terrorism act uh, is that children should be trialed and prosecuted as if they were adults, 
And as a result of this, two thousands of children were taken in into custody through, through the second half of 2000, and they were imprisoned. Some of them were sentenced to more than 10 years. After a very strong civil campaign, some changes were indeed made, and some of the, these kids were released, yet they are um, uh, we are hearing currently that they, many of them are being taken back by the police. They are re, uh, again, uh, arrested once again, or if they are not uh, sentenced to uh, uh, imprisonment, then families are obliged to pay, to pay outrageous amounts of money to the state. And this has, of course, these arrests have had uh, very serious consequences on children. In 2010, one of these arrested kids has burned himself to death. And while another has joined the guerrilla and got killed a year, a year ago in an army operation. So in other words, um, the problem is, uh, uh, even though legal changes have been made, not much has changed because the problem cannot be solved through legal means since this is not a legal problem but a political problem. Uh, meanwhile, again, another legal issue, children kept being killed in and out of protests and the other side of the legal coin has been that police forces are continuously found not guilty in trials, opens again against them. Uh, and uh, several people in the morning have mentioned the Roboski case where 34 people, most of them children, were bombed to death while uh, after having crossed the border from Iraq and no charges were brought against those who bombed them or uh, who ordered the bombing. And finally, so these are the different dimensions, and finally another interesting dimension one should mention is the sexual. Um, because it is at the sexual level, uh, maybe, that the colonial regime of the Turkish state becomes most visible and grotesque. In 2012, children who were kept in Pozanta Correction Center reported that they have been harassed and raped by non-political adult prisoners, and those who reported these crimes were later arrested again, although no charges were brought against the prison guards or adult prisoners. This is one part of it. And meanwhile, several cases where civil servants and army officials in Kurdish towns have collectively and systematically raped girls underage, Kurdish girls underage. And these, have become, these cases have become public and were brought to court attention. Once again, no satisfactory results have been obtained in any of these cases. So we have a specific situation, uh, as you can see from all these examples, where these uh, Kurdish kids have, um, it's not only the legal, but through a variety of different dimensions, these kids are being uh, targeted. Um, and now that we are in the peace process, uh, this is a big, this has, uh, not yet become an issue since uh, this peace process is primarily concerned with um, uh, with what the political actors, what will happen to the political actors and how to po how political actors will be integrated to the system or how political actors will uh, somehow uh, close a peace deal. Uh, but uh, looked from uh, the perspective of children, and the youth, uh, uh, the peace process seems to be extremely complicated and it's uh, an area in itself for struggle and uh, for redefining. Uh, and I will just tell you the three uh, couple of issues that needs to be addressed. Uh, and these are not all, uh, so one of them is how to share power from the perspective of the kids and from the perspectives of the social. Not only, the question is not only how to share power uh, between Kurds and Turks, but between different sections of society. Uh, second, how to, rebuild, how to rebuild the social which has been damaged by state violence. Here the issue is also, uh, or another issue is that uh, 
Now that we have new actors like women, like children, who have taken over the streets, who have become political actors, and we cannot and should not go back. They cannot become non-political. So uh, it's not an issue of rehabilitation. It's not an issue of assistance. It's an issue of how they will remain political, how their political uh, actorship, political agency will be supported in the peace process. Um, another problem is how damaged relations can be repaired. Uh, how uh, legally, socially, politically, um, so how the uh, effects of the of war can be addressed. Uh, another issue will be how to build systems of accountability so that such crimes will not be committed again. Uh, how uh, political related to the previous one. How political, um, so how social policy will take an account of the political agency of children. So social policy today is uh, operates to uh, assimilate, to depoliticize these kids. How can we define an area of social policy as an? Uh, sorry, how can we define social policy? is an area where political agency is supported rather than neutralized or depoliticization occurs. Another issue is how to deal with past crimes. So how are we going to not only how, how are we going to establish accountability today, but how are we going to deal with crimes that already happened, like the killing of children, the murder of uh, children uh, and finally how to, which is going to be again a very debated issue in Turkey how to make a women and children centered security reform there will definitely be hopefully a security reform but how can we and this is an issue that the world is debating how can we have a women and children centered security reform so uh, looked from a, a social perspective, the peace process seems to be very complicated. But so I will end the presentation and uh, I can uh, give you more information uh, in the uh, question answer session. This peace process is all we have and all we can say is that we will try our best, but it seems like um, we will face very similar problems that you are facing here in uh, Ireland in Belfast. Okay, thank you.